Ooh, and we, we are live on Facebook. Good afternoon, Rich, Greg. Good afternoon. Hey, guys. How you guys doing? Um, what's doing good? good? Life is good. Rich, what's good with you? You know, trying to keep it together, uh, trying to move forward. I'm enjoying the fact that there's a little bit of rain, which is kind of nice. Yeah, we needed that. Um, we needed that. For sure. Real bad. 100%. How about yeah. you guys? Um, doing okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. David, what is the purpose of our unscheduled, uh, for yes. those of you joining us, uh, we're definitely not in our scheduled day, scheduled time slot, but, you know, with everything that's going on in our lives, we just made sure that we want to do a very quick kind of, you know, uh, touch base, reach out, uh, recap of what is today's, uh, yes. what is the relevance of, t- of today's date? Yes. Uh, no, thank you for this. The, the cue up on that, Greg, it's the one year anniversary of today. We commemorate in a lot of ways, the one year since the November nine tri-party agreement between Armenia, Russia, and Azerbaijan, which stopped the fighting of the 2020 Artsakh war. Yet I think we would all agree that we're very much still at war with Azerbaijan, regardless of active fighting, um, ceasing on that day. Right, right. right. Well, I mean, I think we, even in the days afterwards and weeks afterwards, we saw um, rearmament, we saw repositioning, we saw, yeah. the, you know, restacking the deck. Uh, and it's just, you know, I, you just have to say from the beginning, um, and I think we've talked about this before, that, you know, for the past year plus, almost two years now, uh, more than a year and a half at least, that, you know, the world has been embroiled in, uh, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, a global crisis with uh, not just supply chains and stuff as, as, as we're seeing now, but, you know, with this pandemic. But Armenians particularly have suffered a little bit more than many other communities in that, you know, we've, we've, we've suffered through uh, an unprecedented war and an unprecedented ignorance. And I mean that in the literal sense, so much of the world ignored what we were going through um, in the midst of this pandemic. And, 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 and so here we are a year later. Uh, and, and while the fighting may have stopped, the positioning certainly hasn't. I, I mean yeah. that not just in military, but in the global global uh, politics of it all so so, so there's true. there's a lot to go through in a short amount of time um but maybe we can at least hit the highlights yeah absolutely absolutely um if, david if you if you don't mind then uh, richard I, i'll just do a quick uh, lead up to a year ago right besides the war, we'll skip through the entirety of the war right sure but what happened on this day and i'm just going to highlight in the way it happened rather than what actually happened. Well, David, you you and Rich can go into the what happened on today, but leading up to this day, we were going through a 44 day uh, massacre. We won't go into, and I won't go into, and I hope one day me and you and Richard can commit to doing a special on the detail day by day uh, analysis of what happened during the war. But anyways, there was a horrendous war that was brought to our doorstep. Um, Azeri aggression, Azeri and Turkish aggression, aggression coupled yeah. with Turkish uh, uh, assistance, yeah, uh, unprecedented assistance, um, a big mistake, as I would call, by the Russian side and Iranian side, maybe kind of trying to, you know, possibly teach a lesson to Pashinyan for uh, being such a pro Western shill. Um, and that resulted in the Turkish presence in the war arena heavy handedly. Where now NATO, even NATO, um, United uh, European Union and Russia, Russia early on, and Iran as well, mentioned that essentially the, the, the Turks were um, uh, in control of the, uh, what do you call it, the commanding forces particularly the air forces, right? Um, with the bringing, an unprecedented bringing, shuttling through uh, Georgia, which I will never forget, a country that closed its border to us under the guise of COVID, uh, to any humanitarian aid from Russia and supply chain of weaponry. So uh, Georgia has a special place in my heart and I will continue uh, beating that drum. Through all of that, through all of that, uh, uh, they brought uh, through NATO, uh, what do you call it? A NATO member was bringing in mercenary jihadists 
from the Afrin region in Syria, which is something you've been mentioning about how America just stepped out and gave everything to Turkey in that area saying, you take care of that and we reap the benefits. And let's not also forget because those countries, they really, really need to be at the forefront of our Armenian uh, uh, consciousness. Azerbaijan being the biggest culprit of this madness, um, there was a, uh, a military backing from Pakistan, a country that does not recognize the uh, existence of the Armenian Republic. And I think there was some sort of a brethren, I love you, shout out from the Taliban and the Afghan government. Okay, so this is what was thrusted on the little democratic republic of Artsakh. Okay. And what ensued was a, a bloodbath, uh, a generational loss of thousands of young men. More than 4,000, yeah. More, more, more than 4,000, which to, I don't know, uh, a country like the United States that just lost 700,000 people to COVID might not mean much, but uh, it's actually, uh, uh, to a country that has less than 3 million people, it's a devastating loss of a generation. Yeah. So that's what happened. Then what happened was that there was a signing of this trilateral, that's BS. Well, trilateral because there were actually three parties in there. Leading up to it, what happened was they're complete because we were drunk here with the you know Donald Trump land, right? Yeah. Uh, complete uh, giveaway of America's foreign policy in that region. Um, and uh, we, is Rich, Rich, you still with us? I'm with you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to finish. And, be, and the Western vacuum and the void of this entire, like there was no presence, any kind, except, except for Turkey, let's call it, in this war arena during a pretty, pretty noticeable time frame. You cannot say in a normal time that this can, could, could go ignored, this, this horrible war, but especially when we were all hashtag, you know, isolating, sitting at home, in the time of a pandemic, it was the loudest event of the globe and it was completely ignored by everything Western. So the Eastern powers and the powers around here, thank you, David, that's the three signatories. In uh, Russia. Uh, the prime ministers of, uh, you know, representatives of Russia, Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia signed this. But last thing I'm gonna say before I hand it over to you guys is there was nothing, nothing, nothing. There were three horrendous attempts, if I could even not call them attempts of a ceasefire. And then there were this, um, essentially these, this capitulation with nine horrendous bullet points, none of which, none of which favored Armenia in any way. No. And in its eventual implementation, this is, guys, we're a show educating the diaspora. We were caught off guard on knowing what... Artsakh was, many of us, sorry, hashtag I am blaming you. Uh, get your S together and start learning about what it is. Um, many of you now know. And uh, what do you call it? Suddenly we are thrusted into these nine bullet points that have absolutely nothing towards uh, the, the future of Armenia. As a matter of fact, if everything is hardline implemented, it will be the, the handicapping of Armenia forever and ever. So that's what happened. And the reason, right. the way that it was happened was there was no communication to the, to, the, to, the, to the country. There was chaos, 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 chaos. Where is this guy going? I remember I took a walk with my father and we saw it on Facebook. Nikol yep. Kachinian well, I mean, yeah. signed, this, uh, signed this thing. No OSC men's group, something that you, Richard, and I grew up with hearing about, right? The mediators of this thing. And now we're a year on. Okay, that was my setting. Well, I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff to cover there. There's a lot to unpack with that, Greg. I mean, you know, a lot of the chaos, you know, one could argue is just part of war. Uh, the other part of it is, is it's, it's a part of a weak government or maybe a deliberate government. And I think that's part of the problem. We don't we don't really know uh, whether it was it, it was a weak government or whether it was deliberate. Um, that there was chaos and lack of in, pro proper information flow. But the other thing I'd like to do is pull back a little bit. And this is a point that, you know, you and I spoke about the other day. Um, I, we, you know, before I, in good conscience, put the blame on other people and put the blame on the media and put the blame on the, the, the lack of 
uh, engagement by the public, there's two things that I'd like to bring up. Number one, that most of the pathways that we use to have these discussions are throttled by other uh, entities like Facebook or Instagram. And we, we spoke about this pre-show. Um, so that's one, one thing. So even if we are saying, hey, can you please help? Um, you know, I worked to try and get, um, you know, senators and, and House Rep representatives to begin to adopt resolutions about recognizing Artsakh in the first place. And this has been happening since, uh, I mean, I started my, my work in 2009 uh, working on that, I mean, in earnest. And so when, when I think about the kind of work that many of us in the diaspora could have done to recognize, to help the United States and many other countries recognize Artsakh as an independent entity worthy of recognition and support. And many of us failed at that, at that job. And as a result, when, when with brand new information to them, well, what, what is this going on? Many media outlets received it as there's an internal conflict that these Armenians are occupying what is known by the international community as part of Azerbaijan. Now, many of us know that that is not physically actually the case, but on paper to the people that don't know, that's what they think. And so when they see, oh, there's this conflict and there are these, oh, I don't want to pay attention to it. So it's not going to get a whole lot of media coverage. Would you guys, do you guys agree or disagree with any of that? I would not fully agree because, but I would agree with your uh, state sentiment about oh. it, but it's to putting the onus on them being ill-informed. Something that I've noticed uh, that we as Armenians, no, no, I get it, I get it. Uh, my, my, my conversation is this. It's not that they don't understand. It's that, that there actually is a narrative and it's an anti-Armenian narrative. Now, in my opinion, I won't, I won't, I won't that's, disagree that's, with driven, that. that's driven by geopolitical power. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That's, and, Absolutely. and a lack of awareness, a lack Absolutely. of time for these media outlets to digest information, you know, like the outlets that did report on it fairly properly, if you will, there was still deficiency, actually had everything spelled out to them and had help from their media community providing them information uh, in, in some cases, but that was very rare. So we, we saw it very, very early on like what you just were touching on, Rich and Greg, is just how much geopolitics are completely, uh, Armenia is completely just overruled by geopolitics and has no ability to overcome that, at least not in the near term. Uh, and on top of that, the, the media was just the media power. The media barrage was clearly driven by those in power. Yes, and what you're yeah. saying, David, is not is yeah is, is yeah I, I I agree with with it. I I, I would also argue this um, that it is very hard for Western powers to get behind Armenia because Armenia is close to Russia and Iran. The exactly. Two people exactly. That, that I mean, for Iran to push back on Azerbaijan and say no, I we don't really feel comfortable with you having military exercises on our border. That's that benefits us. And right now, as per this capitulation, uh, Russia is essentially the only thing. It's right. Sorry, Rich. Everyone, Rich, one, Rich, we have an audio. Thing real once quick. in a while, your audio just yeah, kind of we, cuts in, but not, 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 not right now. But just like once in, a, it's okay. It's okay. Um, I, I, right. Your point is noted. Um, we're dependent we can, on Russia. Let's, we're let's very dive dependent. in to the actual what it what it was, uh, David. Uh, run us through um, what happened. My only point was to set it up in a way that it was chaos. Uh, Rich, right. you mentioned, and David, you echoed that it was an anti-Armenian worldly view of oh, it's just a bunch of uh, separatists trying to up to no good yeah. in a very it. dumbed down way. It right. was a diaspora caught off guard. Many of us have been saying, you know, uh, recognize genocide, genocide. I'm from Vaughn, I'm from Mush, having no understanding of what Artsakh is. And it was Yerevan, predominantly, I'm going to put the onus on them, where I would go to Armenia time and time again. And I go to Artsakh, yet they all live out there and never have visited. So all of this came into this perfect storm. And with the result of this nine point anti-Armenian 
trilateral Cap signing. Armenian capitulation, right? It's a capitulation. Yeah. So, and and those of us in the know realize that right away, right? We knew right away this just did not sit right. And there's many of the agreements have not been fulfilled, right? We continue to see, yes, there's Russian peacekeepers there, but we, we since this agreement was enacted, we've seen acts of aggression continuously, and it has spilled over into Armenia, attacks on the border, incursions on the border, burning of Armenian crops and villages, uh, the control of the Goris Kapan Road, which is the north-south highway that's along the border of Armenia and Azerbaijan, which has impacted Armenian commerce. They've arrested Iranian truck drivers. They've fined Iranian truck drivers, so it's gotten Iran involved. And then we're seeing, it feels like more recently, these acts of aggression on the civilians of Artsakh, who their resolve is one of the most important things, one of the most important factors of our Armenian nation right now, uh, and ongoing, has always been, right? Greg, you can argue has always been. Their resolve, 120,000 Artsakhs that, that reside in Artsakh right now, there's 30,000 that are still displaced, mm -hmm. either in Armenia or other, other, other places, in other parts of Armenia, most like, mostly. Uh, but those 120,000 that are still there are the only things right now, aside from the Russian peacekeepers, that are ensuring Artsakh stays Artsakh for now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I cannot argue with anything you said there. Um, I'm going to then, uh, we are now a year on, right? Yes. And there's still POWs. There's still POWs. Yeah, I mean, that was the I other thing that, that so, is important to know. Yeah. So, so a lot of this can be put on the, the aggressor, right? But right. a lot of it, at some point, we have this rhetoric of, oh, uh, as, as recent as like a few days ago, I was at a social gathering when the seemingly reasonable army individuals mentioned that, oh, it was the previous administration that gave this to uh, 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 the poor Pashinyan administration. And now we have this. Um, that is an ignorant opinion. Um, that is an ignorant opinion of someone that hasn't been uh, reading this situation for the past three decades. Because sure, let's go with the idea that it was the previous administration's pillaging and the corruption and blah, 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 blah. You're now in power for three years. And leading up to the war, there were clear indicators that this is about to happen. Me and you and Rich were caught off guard, although we, were, we had our sensitivity heightened to it because, we, you know, um, and uh, oh, by the way, you notice one thing. Uh, remember, Tavush was on the front line of everything Arach Media did. Since this has stopped, somehow all the Azeri troops on the Tavush side no longer are harassing Armenians there. Why? Because there's a, you know, there's a there's a bigger fish to fry. Now you could like attack Armenia's southern flank, which was very well protected by Artsakh. Okay, yes. by Artsakh yes. being there. Yes. Um, and lastly, a recap of last year. Nothing, 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 nothing. Ceasefire failure, ceasefire failure, three ceasefire failures. Finally, boom, in the thick of the night, he gets called into Kremlin with Aliyev and they sign this anti-Armenian nine point. Um, then there's referendums, then there's the, 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 the election, uh, chaos ensues in Armenia, complete disregard of a global pandemic currently leading into the worst, the worst, uh, uh, wave Armenia has seen uh, outside of the wartime. Uh, David, oh, yeah. you, you and I even looked at the COVID wave. That you cannot blame on Kocharyan. I just, you, you got to be a moron to blame that on them. Although I've seen arguments similarly to blame it on Kocharyan. Um, when people no argued about things in 1993 when Kocharyan wasn't even in Armenia uh, on Kocharyan. So that is one thing. Um, we found body bags of Armenian soldiers improperly stored at morgues with zero, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, response from the Ministry of uh, Health until pressed against it. Um, right. There is zero, zero accountability on every which level. So David, when we're talking about trying to say something positive, I'm going to say this positive. It is positively blissful that we are still around because of what was being you know thrusted on us is so much of the unthinkable um the defense ministry 
There was an attempt of pushback at, at Coach uh, at, at, at Pashinyan early on with the hopes of ousting him. No, uh, that wasn't, uh, you know, that, no. that was turned into some kind of a, a joke. Um, then we find out that the Minister of Defense, this is still this last year, the Minister of Defense that was leading us through the war, uh, Sir Tanoyan, it was a complete, uh, 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 what do you call it, pillage and plunderer. Um, so if we're going to, you know, put the onus on the previous guys, we really need to start right. magnifying lens on the current guys. The Tanoyan was the current guy's defense minister. Um, we have the blunder on international scales of the how many ministers left two right uh, of foreign affairs uh, the foreign ministers right one left immediately as a result of this november 9th right. um not Sakanyan just said i can't i i won't be the the guy that's going to be then handing this to the armenian nation right. um and then the other guy that left uh, i think what was it in may around may or so stuck around for five months he was the deputy right. foreign minister and his leaving let's not forget was also saying this I cannot stay around to uh, what do you call it uh, to uh, what do you call it put forth the things that I've heard are going to be asked of the Armenian nation, okay, or Armenian Republic. Yeah. yeah. So right. this is well, Greg, I mean, and, here's, here's, yeah. here's here's I want to distill down a little bit about what what you're saying. I I I, I would agree that there is always a little bit of a, an argument that is legitimate to make when one says. Hey, listen, I inherited a big mess, okay? Um, however, my pushback on that is not um, that that's invalid. My pushback is if you stand up and you say, I want this job, I demand this job, I think I can do better, and you know what? When I get in, I'm going to do much better. Then you better fess up and you better do better. And you can't use the, well, I inherited a problem as the reason for failure. Because that's bullshit. I'm sorry. I'm going to call it exactly what it is. It's wrong. And I and I would say that Trump did it. I'm saying that, you know, our current prime minister has done it too. And the people that surround him that say that are covering up for something. Because it's either it's either there's something nefarious that they're covering up for, or they're covering up their own ignorance of the situation. It's one of the two. Yeah. It can't be much more than that. Because yeah. if you ask for the job, you demand the job, you get the job, you better do the job. It's that simple. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, that's well said, Rich. And we haven't seen a lot of change, right? Look, he had a resounding victory in the June elections, uh, the current prime minister, resounding victory, which faced a lot of contention or contest, right? Uh, but now the largest contest we've seen since the election time period has now emerged in the last 24, 48 hours from yeah. Armenia, coinciding with this. November 9, one year since the agreement, uh, 2020, November 9, 2020. So I'm going to share the screen real quick here on this, uh, everybody, so you could see what I'm referring to. This may or may have not be very front knowledge, everybody. We found out late the other night um, as it was happening. So, Greg, what can we tell everyone about, yeah, it was about a, this it was right large. now? It was a humongous gathering. Uh, uh, what do you call it? And again, I, you know, I love... <laughs> <laughs> the framing the here's this pro, photo look yeah pro western uh lady or real liberty why well, this is like yellow journalism at its best check out you see like the, the man over there has an artsakh photo on his uh, on his on his shirt i had friends that were like stationed in sunik saying that there was anti artsakh sentiment all over the place but i'm wow. happy to see a very 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 resounding large crowd coming out of what's going on and the essentially realigning of the of the of, of the country now let me tell you to those that think that this has to happen forever and ever and ever well he got elected it was a blah 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 yeah <laughs> richard yeah. you would uh, you would appreciate that david scroll up notice the choice of which uh, which photo the the photo of cocheran that looks like dracula <laughs> rather than right. anything that would well, <laughs> and, and this is here's yeah, another right. source here's another source here's another source yeah, yeah. this is radio so, free liberty uh, our main alliance liberty. announces yeah. new push for regime change so exactly. like exactly. coinciding with the november 9 uh, agreement one year anniversary mm -hmm. there were these new protests with thousands of people taking to the streets calling for the resignation of Nico Pashinyan. So this caught me by surprise to a certain extent because coming off of now, yeah, what, it's been a few months since June, but that resounding victory in June, he got the votes 
yet there's thousands that are calling for his resignation. Will this result in anything we have yet to see? So Right. Um, so this is the last thing I will say about Pashinyan and this whole regime and the regime change and, and all that. Um, I think it's important for people to speak up. I think it's important for people to be able to share and express their opinions. I believe that it is important for us to distill down and get the truth. I will also say that while um, there is a large amount of anti-Pashinian um, sentiment going on, much of it I think is legitimate. Uh, some of it, the reality is, is I don't know the man's heart. I don't know exactly what his plans are. I only know what we see, what we've reported on. And what we've seen and reported on leads us to believe certain things that land us in an anti-Pashinian camp. But I will also say this, that the demands, and this has historically been true regardless um, and we can trace it all the way back to uh, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. The reality is, is that when you envision taking power, when you envision designing uh, a uh, you know your 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 government, when you envision and you see it from the outside, the realities of the job once you're on the inside are fundamentally different than than what you saw on the outside. And the things that you have to do and the things that you have to capitulate to change. Now, does that mean that so much should have been capitulated for Armenia and Artsakh? I don't think so. But I'm also not in that job. So I'm just trying to leave a little bit of openness for rational thought and not be so emotionally bound, because I think many of us are, and with legitimate reasons. So uh, that, that's yeah. all I'm going to say on that. No, there, is, there, is, there is absolutely, I, I agree with you, and I agree with that kind of sort of a, you know, a, a, a bird's eye view right. of this of this incident but you know the every single step of the way right we're seeing this and we can wrap this up right um the last thing that david actually you also mentioned that was a very there was only one beacon of kind of sanity in this insane administration in my opinion because the insanity comes from every angle including some that are related to me i'm not gonna say okay actual distant cousins are in the administration mm -hmm. um which was, was the human rights defender Tanoyan has been right. always a beacon of steady like well okay doesn't matter about international doesn't matter oh, what about the POWs what about right. the human rights violation what about this blah, blah, blah. and what happens last week uh, he's getting uh, sacked and pushed out because or there's threats of, of that there's threats of there's that. threats of that it's gonna happen trust me um, uh, in my opinion and my question is why Exactly. Why? Why? Because he's doing that a good is... job. Because he's doing a job. Because he's questioning the status quo that we have right now. Because which is not a positive status quo. Uh, but but just real quick to Rich's point, and, and I appreciate you sharing that, Rich. Because I try to look at that too. Like you know, I try to be a, a voice of reason. Like it it feels like it felt like. And I don't want to be all emotional or anything like that. But it felt like it it almost seemed like Pashinyan had no choice. Or did he? We don't know. It's almost as he was pushed into this kind of agreement. He, what kind of power does he have over Putin and Aliyev, right? But sure, but I, uh, sure, but and I, I, yeah, I don't okay. mean to. That doesn't make yeah, it okay, think, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, no. I, I, I understand your point, and I yeah. can totally see that. I would also argue this way. It's yeah. not like he came out of nowhere for him. It's not like he didn't campaign, camp campaign on a on a on a platform of let's do away with the art talk quiet question because we have things to focus on in Armenia itself. As yeah. though art talk has 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 never been part of Armenia. As though it has never. I mean, Greg, well, we spoke about this earlier, Greg. You know, of all of the provinces, art talk has always been Armenian. So so to 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 to, to think that this that that. That you can categorize Artsakh as some um, backwoods, yeah. back 40 that we don't want to deal with, and then suddenly act surprised like, oh, what happened? I, I got forced into this agreement. I, ah, you know, well, he, right. didn't want, he didn't want to deal with Artsakh in the first place. So that's where a lot of the, the, the this, this sentiment about, okay, he sold us out. That's where that comes from. It's well, uh, and, and, and he said and, yeah, he let, wanted let, to do let it. Me, let, let, since we went there, and uh, I literally, with our 20 minute show is like going into the, the, the but I enjoy this conversation. It's impossible to do 20 minutes. No, because show. the three, no, the three of us have been through it. The three of us have been through it, literally glued to every fact and right. story for the past year and then uh, more than that, year and 44 right. days. But what I'm trying to say here is this. If we're going to go into the territory of the woeful ignorance uh, to an administration, I'm going to then start 
walking uh, step by step to every time he was given the opportunity to see it. Remember when Trump just came into office, the first mistake he did was when he called, got, a, got the phone call from Taiwan and then was surprised why China just flipped the F out. It's because Taiwan's been always the protector under protection of America, but through back channels, right. because we, we have something called politics and right. geopolitics. Well, guess what in May or April of last year, Pashinyan did it. Even I, a, a big patriot of Artsakh, thought that was a little bold when he walked into Shushi and said, Artsakh is Armenia, right? Yep. Uh, Ter Petrosyan, Kocharan, or Ser Sarkisyan didn't do things like that, okay? So Be is, he ignorant, or is, of it. is he ignorant or is he trying to like, you know, uh, provoke something? Number one, number two, right. uh, we're uh -huh. talking about how we need one sec how we need iran right and russia he's he was the anti-russian candidate and he got his way we wanted reform and now uh putin's uh, seemingly Actually, irked no. about it and then the one thing that yeah sure it might have started during the sir sarkisian administration but there was really really no need for us to open up the israeli um oh i apologize i listed all of the perpetrators against armenia in this war, and I forgot our dear friend Israel. Yeah, Israel man. takes the cake outside of now, Azerbaijan, yeah. Turkey, then goes Israel, then the 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 mercenaries, then uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. So Israel, you're number three. So it was really no need for him to start and open up the Israeli uh, embassy in Yerevan and then in uh, Jerusalem or wherever the hell they did that. Uh, so <coughs> you isolate Russia, you isolate, uh, well, you piss off Iran, um, I don't know if it's ignorance. He then, uh, this is another interesting point. Armenia is part of the CSTO treaty, right? This NATO, like the anti-NATO group. It's a right. military pact between the, these fledgling former Soviet Union. Um, and the, the presidentship of the CSTO group is on a rotating, uh, what do you call it? Uh, premiership, whatever, Basically. leadership, right? And it's essentially the, the, the military leaders of each country, they go around and around, just kind of like the European Union does the whole presidency of European Union is on a rotation. I'll be quick. In the middle of Armenia being the leader of CSTO and chairman having the chairmanship, Pashinyan comes into office and arrests the Armenian guy that's sitting in Moscow and is in charge of that. So y'all tell me if he's woefully ignorant or if he's doing things that he, he wants to do. That's my take. Well, yeah. I, I... Time well. I, 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 let me just let me just say, for the record, if there's ever anything that I don't know, I want to know about it. Mm -hmm. So if I'm ignorant about something, I'd like to be educated. I'm not one of those guys that wants to dig in my heels and say, "No, I think I know everything." So I mean, I'm I always want to be able to change my mind. As far as I'm concerned, the only way to keep growing is to is to keep learning and understanding and. Being, able, not, being will, flexible and willing to change, change change your mindset. That has nothing to do with integrity or ethos. It's about mm -hmm. willingness to learn more and then to adopt more and then to be able to reposition yourself appropriately. Thank you, That's thank awesome. you, thank you for saying that because we yes. we need that. And, uh, and to wrap this up, I think between the three of us, uh, all of us have like I was pretty much I was pro Pashinyan, and I'll make that statement because I have the ability. I to always gain. questioned. I always and David questioned. was the, the the one that was a little bit skeptical about this guy. He came out of nowhere. He this and this and that. And for me, uh, the, the 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 aha moment started coming in pre-war, and now I'm like my my eyes have been opened completely. Yeah. So obviously, we're going to keep an eye on these these new protests, these new calls for his resignation as as they develop. Uh, there are some positives I think we could share to wrap up. And if that's okay with both of you, right. Um, one, you know, I said it in our prep guys, I'm going to share it. You guys feel free to add any comments to this uh, as you will. I, I choose to see the fact that we have 120,000 Armenians back in Artsakh residing there, holding their ground, staying home with the threat of these snipers that are happening on uh, in Artsakh now of civilians, uh, they are the heroes. They are our heart and soul of our nation. Totally. And we need, they are needed and, and we know that. And they are the, they are Artsakh, they are Armenia right now. And I think that's a very, it's a positive thing. There's 120,000 there. We got to get the 30,000 that are displaced 
back there if that's at all possible. The and that's going to take time. No well, more than that, they need to be protected. Absolutely, yeah. they are. They, I mean, right now, obviously, whether well, the beastkeepers are there, it's a matter of time before we see how long uh, they reside. Wait a minute, David, are you trying to tell me that there are over a hundred thousand obstinate and like you know resistant Armenians? No way. That's shocking to me. One hundred twenty, man. Good for them. One hundred twenty, rich. Uh, and yeah, this way it's a very positive thing. The other thing I've never met a stubborn Armenian in my life. Right. Right. So real right. quick. So we wrap up two events. I want to make sure people are aware of, uh, and they are a visit from uh, people from Armenia that are coming here to the Bay area. The first one, um, is going to take place this Friday, uh, November 12th. Uh, hold on one second. I apologize. I don't have it up. Yeah, if you guys, we've talked about them a little bit on the show, uh, but the IFS, the Insurance Foundation for Servicemen uh, in Armenia, uh, this this organization is non-governmental, provides monetary aid, financial aid to families of our of soldiers that have that have fallen um, in service or that have been disabled in service. Uh, two leaders from the organization are coming to meet with the Bay Area Friday at 8 at uh, the Kachetonimir Kach uh, Kach Community Center, Soran Hall at KZV on Brotherhood Way. The other one is November 19, Friday, the following week. Uh, it's going to be a community town hall with Mr. Armand Tatoyan, uh, the current human rights defender, the ombudsman of Armenia. Hopefully he will still be in that position when he comes here and hopefully he will remain in that position he's done a lot of very important work uh, dealing with human rights issues facing um armenia and Artsakh. so Sorry, those are the my, two events that are happening i yeah. think everyone should come out to those correction yeah. i called him tanoyan the defense minister is tanoyan this You're is right. armand tatoyan i stand yes. corrected my the, ego the last myself. the last thing we could touch on gentlemen i think it's important to touch on is our successful Yes. Screenings that were held uh, in Berkeley at the Elmwood and in Sacramento uh, at St. James Armenian Church. Rich, thank you. Thank you so much for making that happen in Sacramento and to St. James Armenian Church for making that possible. But we raised, they gentlemen, we raised, champions. say that again. We're sorry. They were the real champions. I mean, they, they really be able were. to pivot like that with us was just uh, remarkable. They really were. So you see Jeevan there with Rich, myself, Greg, Nanin. Uh, Narine uh, Boscan, I believe was her last name, right, from Armenia. She's the current screenwriter for his next project. Uh, but this was an amazing two days that we had with them. And also, I want to share that Jivon, well, we raised, we raised right around $4,500 for Jivon with our two screenings. And he raised over 50000 right, Greg, on his North America tour. Yeah. And then he, he last met, thing he met his goal of a hundred thousand go fund me. And I was going to share that right now as we wrap up uh, for the afternoon. Where is the go fund me right here? I have it right here somewhere. There it is. I will share this and then we could wrap up gentlemen, but uh, there it is revival his next project, which is a very, very uh, interesting and unique story narrative that's going to deal with the 2020 Artsakh War, but he raised more than 100,000 on that project. And it's thanks to the generosity of many of our followers and viewers and those that came to the screenings and and uh, and all the supporters of Jivan of Adisa. So, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I also, and I know this is a little bit off topic, but it's you know, in, in, in the vein of, uh, you know, these, these premieres. Um, I also would like to make a, a, a brief shout out. I know Greg, this may not sit well with you, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, uh, for Emil Gessen's film, uh, 45 yeah. Days, because Absolutely. I, I just think that if we're talking about raising the awareness of uh, Artsakh voices, while he's not an Artsakhsi or even an Armenian, uh, I think having the narrative out there and discussing it is important. So please go see not only that film, but but really support Jivan, uh, because I look at these two men as one of them is is on the front lines doing some of the eyes, and Jivan is more the heart and the soul. 
and I, I, I'd like to, I'd like to think that both men are doing some kind of good, good work. Um, and so, Absolutely. and I think absolutely. it's great that, that we were in some way a part of any of it. So I'm just thankful for that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Emil uh, is finishing up his North America screenings as we speak. Uh, so good mention of that, Rich. Of course, two different types of films, a documentary from the front lines that Emil produced as a non-Armenian, as a former Royal Marine, uh, and then uh, Jivon producing narrative stories that are important uh, to tell our story as well. So, well, right. Uh, unfortunately, on that note, I have to bow out because no, I think I do. I do have yeah, to stop. Uh, we, uh, I'm glad that we are doing this, guys. I'm happy to be yes. doing it with you. Uh, more things to come, uh, yes. gentlemen. If I jump on, you can jump off. You guys. No, I think I think we no, can think wrap up. Let's wrap. Let's wrap, guys. Okay. Thank you so much, and thank you for watching. Uh, more, more to come as we go forward. So. All right, and stay tuned. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.